Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Coming off a big Grey Cup win for the Stampeders, it's Dan and Matt back talking Flames hockey. How you doing, buddy? Good as always. Did you watch the Grey Cup game? Unfortunately, I was busy at the time, but it was good to see Calgary get the win. Especially when it's over a team in the East. It always feels better when we beat someone in the East. Well, isn't it always the, against an Eastern Conference opponent? The, the, Grey, the Grey Cup is, but I mean, whether it's, you know, the Calgary Flames or the Oilers, or, or sorry, the Calgary Flames or the Stampeders, it always feels better when we're beating somewhere out of Toronto, whether it's the Leafs or the, you know, Cats. Yeah, true enough. And that's what, Calgary's uh, fifth Grey Cup now? I think so, yeah. I'm not a big uh, Stamps fan. I generally just watch that game. But, yeah, that sounds about right. Mm-hmm. It's nice that both teams are on upward trajectory. The Stamps are champions now. The Flames are doing really well. It's a good time to be a sports fan in the city. I think we should uh, possibly steal the City of Champions sign from Edmonton. Well, we'll see. If, if the Flames can become champions this year, too, I think it's definitely warranted. <laughs> Well, there's a lot to talk about this week. Let's talk about the games last week. We had a week that you weren't too sure how we were going to do. I think I was a bit more optimistic than you. Uh, Six points from the table, and the Flames came away with four of them. They, of course, lost the away game to the Ducks in the Honda Center. For some reason, we have a curse, and we just can't win there. We beat the Sharks 2-0, and we beat the uh, Arizona Coyotes 3-0. How many of those games do you watch? Uh, All of them. I watch every game. So with the Flames now, I think, proving that we can play, even if we can't win necessarily, even, you know, the Ducks game was pretty close, but beating the Sharks, beating the Coyotes, I think we've proven that we can play with the big boys in this league. What about you? Yeah, they've been rather exceptional, even against the hardest working teams that they're, or talented teams that they're going up against. Like, San Jose is one of the fastest teams in the league, and yet the Flames easily kept up with them and gave them fits so it's good even the week before with chicago i mean we only lost that game by one goal it was a uh, 4-3 loss so it's not like we're getting blown out by these teams no and even the loss in anaheim the difference was a goal scored on our net by a puck going in off our foot and one not counting because it went off our foot so and that's the difference right there you know, that was the game as I was watching it where I thought this could actually be the game where we break the curse. Yeah. Like just the way the Flames were playing, I thought they might break that curse. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, you know, it's the Honda Center. <laughs> and the last, uh, oddly enough, the last uh, five times the Flames have won in Anaheim, four of them have been road games in January. So. Really? Yeah. Just one of those bizarre quirks, so I, I'm i wondering when the next time the Flames play the Ducks. Hopefully it's in January. Maybe we might have a chance then. You know it would be awful this year is if the Flames make the playoffs and they end up playing the uh, Ducks in a, where the Ducks have the home ice advantage because then we got to start the first two games in the Honda Center. Well, we did win a playoff game in Anaheim in when we played them in the 0506, so... We have had some success there when it's an actual playoff series. So, But that was also like 10 years ago. True. This week we also have some Flames who've got league recognition, which is awesome. Mark Giordano became the first star of the NHL for the month of November. And Kerry Ramo, the third star of the week. I was surprised that Ramo looked as exceptional as he did, and I think it goes back to what you and I have talked about with him, of needing the competition to look better. We talked about that last year with Rito Barra, and he seemed to look better when he got competition there. I think we're seeing it again this year with Jonas Hiller. Yeah, exactly. And with Ramo, he looked shaky in his first start against New Jersey, and... It took him a while to figure it out in that game, but like from the second period on in that start, he started to turn it around and started looking pretty good and made several good saves in the third period in overtime before winning that game in the shootout. And that level of play continued right through the Sharks game and the Coyotes game. Yeah, and I mean, it's 
it's weird because I thought for a while that Hiller had, you know, wrapped up the starting goalie job here, and then you see Ramo come out with a week like he did, and now I think we're back to not really having a defined starter. Yeah, and the thing is with Hiller is that in the last couple of weeks, pretty much every game he's given up a really bad goal, and... It hasn't really hurt the Flames in the standings, but he needs some time off to figure out and recompose himself. And thankfully, we have a good backup slash 1A starter. Uh, A luxury most teams would die to have that problem. Exactly, because now Hiller can take it easy for a week or so, maybe more, depending on how good Ramo continues to play, and Ramo gets a chance to retake the starting job. Yeah. At least it's not a situation like the Oilers where you put Scrivens or Fast in and each of them suck, so... (laughs) Well, and I mean, we've had years like that. We've had years where we weren't confident in either goalie. We've had years where we've had one goalie we were confident in, not the backup. So I, I think it's really cool for this team now to have two goaltenders that together, I think, make up quite an awesome pairing. Yeah, uh, at least with this duel, uh, you don't have to worry about the goaltending at all. It's just not a issue. Because if one guy's not doing so hot, put the other guy in and switch off when he gets cold. So. Exactly. I don't think there's probably much we need to say about uh, Giordano winning the Player of the Month for November. I mean, he and Brody together have looked exceptional this year. And the only thing I guess I'm surprised about is that they're both wearing Flames jerseys. For players playing like that, you'd expect that they'd probably be on more of a contender team. What, you don't think the Flames are a contender? <laughs> uh, we, we still have yet to prove this, but I mean, coming into this season, you wouldn't have thought that, but... Those two guys have definitely boosted the Flames' um, standings. They would not be where they are without Gio playing as well as he is. And I, I think we can all agree with that. If Gio wasn't doing what he's doing, this team would not be where they are in the standings. Definitely. And, well, when you're starting to see reporters say that Giordano should get consideration for the Hart Trophy and not laughing immediately afterwards you know he's been off to a really excellent start. And I mean, last year we were looking at him saying he was kind of the shining star on that team. He was the guy that looked better than everybody else. And I think that was the beginning of this, I don't want to say transformation. He's always been a good defenseman, but I think last year he had to step up into a new role, being the captain and kind of being the new face. And he's definitely embraced it. I think it took him a year to fully understand his full capability. But I love what we've got in this guy now. What a great piece to build around on the blue line. Yeah, and the same story with TJ Brody. The last couple of years, he's been focusing on becoming an elite defensive defenseman and not really focusing so much on the offensive game. Like, he was good, but not exceptional. I think he had, like, 30 points last year, and... 25 games into the season he's almost at that point now and now he's focusing on both ends of the ice not just being a good defensive defenseman which he is he's also translating that into both goals and point assists for the points and it's weird for the flames because in that one tandem on the blue line brody giordano we have 40 points between the two like there's 46. not a lot of 46 is it 46 now? Yeah, 25 for Geo, 21 for Brody. So in that case, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of teams that would be lucky to get that from one player, much less one defenseman. And we've got split among two. And the nice thing there, and I've been worried about this, is what happens if one of them goes down? But I think that because there's two of them, if we lose one of them to injury for a while, we're not totally screwed. True. It, we would probably It'll start... take some adjusting for the guy who's, a, who's still around to adjust somebody else, but it's not like we have one guy who's got 40-odd 40, 40 points, and if we lose him, we're screwed. Yeah. Well, we would probably start to lose some games just because that is a very important piece of the team, but they would be able to muddle through for a while 
Like, it, it, I would just hope that wouldn't be, like, a month-long injury like Giordano had last year. Well, and that's my worry, is it? I know last year, I don't know historically, but I know last year he was out for a while, and if he if that happens again, you're right, they could model through for a while, and I think they have enough points built up that they'd probably be able to, you know, kind of rest on those points for a week or two. But if he's out for a month, I think Brody will still be productive, but if one half of that tandem is gone, it's going to take Brody a while to adjust to a new partner. And for that guy, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure that he's got to fill those that those shoes that Gio went out. So I don't know that we'd be as effective. No. And, well, you take the star player from any team out for a month, and I don't care which team you're talking about. They're going to hurt. So... When the Flames signed the new TJ Brody deal this season, I thought that at first I was looking at the deal going, ah, this year he's going to be overpaid. Next year maybe a little bit overpaid, and he'll probably grow into this contract. But already the deal's starting to look fantastic. He looks underpaid this year at $2.1 million. But I think you know if you kind of average that along with next year, this is already starting to look like a fantastic deal. Oh, yeah. A uh, complete steal of a contract. Like if he, they had signed him in the off season instead uh, I think you'd probably see at least a million dollars a season more if not more than that and you know as much as we're going to have a lot of cap room to play with this year and next year and going forward I like that the Flames are making good fiscal decisions now our top line defense who I believe is going to stay the top line of defense through this rebuild is only going to cost us 10 million for the pair yeah, exactly, and you see guys like P.K. Subban getting $9 million a year. You know, you can only afford that so many of that level of contract on your team before you hit the cap, so the fact that they managed to get Brody under contract for as long as they did, for as cheap as they did, that will help... Especially when you're talking like a cup contending team, like say Chicago in the past, like you need to have like three solid lines of forwards plus four really good defensemen. So with only having $70 million to play with, having one of the key pieces of that team being locked down for under $4 million is a bargain. Yeah, and I mean, it's they could still go out and get, if they wanted to, I'm not saying they should, but they could still go out and get somebody like a Subban, a, a top defenseman who is making 10, knowing that their whole first line's making 10. It almost balances itself out, that you could take on one high-priced defenseman to play on your 3-4 pairing, knowing your top line is, is making you know less than that, and it'll all balance itself out, which is I think gives them a lot of options going forward, and that's really cool. Yeah, exactly. Like, they could easily fit in, say, like, Jay Bomeister, that level of a contract without any problem. They already kind of have that with Weidman, but, you know, even that's on the cheap side. Yeah. I think that as we start to get a young defenseman come into the system, whoever that might be, whether it's someone that's here now or someone we get through trade or acquisition... I think we're going to need to keep some cap room there for another guy to let him move up the pay scale. Yeah. And having those two locked up for so cheap is going to be nice because we're going to have that. We saw so often when this was Feaster's team that we ran into cap issues when we were spending the cap. It was we had to make such and such a trade because we needed to move cap. Or, you know, we had to let somebody go back to the farm or put them on waivers to clear cap. So it's nice to know even when we do get to be more of a contending team, that we're being fiscally responsible now to give ourselves some success there in the future. Exactly. And part of the rebuilding process, like you need to have everything come together just at the right time in order to win a Stanley Cup. Like what happened with Chicago in 09, where they had all their, like, Taze and Kane on entry level deals while having guys like Campbell that were making a ton. And. The Flames can afford to have a few star player level contracts, but once guys like Monaghan, Bennett, and Goudreau start playing and finishing off their contracts, they're going to be needing five, six million dollar a year contracts, and that salary cap comes at you quite quickly. <laughs> well, and even in two years, um, Geo's contract is up. 
and he's going to need a renewal, and we want to make sure we've got money for that as well, because that's one piece of this rebuild I don't want to lose. Put it this way, anything under 8 is a bargain when it comes to Geo. For sure. I was talking about the successes the Flames have had this year. I was thinking on the weekend. I was looking at the pieces that have gone into making this team as successful as it has this year, and I think the one thing that not a lot of people give enough credit to is the coaching. I think Bob Hartley's been a big part of the Flames team. And it made me start to wonder, what do you think it would take for Bob Hartley to win the Jack Adams Trophy this year? For those that don't know, the Jack Adams Trophy is the coach awarded to um, essentially the best coach. I'll read you the actual language around it from the NHL site. So the Jack Adams Trophy reads, it's awarded annually to the coach adjudged to have contributed the most to his team's success. And if I look at the roster of the 30 coaches so far this year, I don't think there's one coach who I'd attribute more to their team's success than Bob Hartley. What about you? Oh, no. And it was just like Patrick Waugh last year with Colorado, where they went from being the number one overall pick to being one of the top teams in the league. It's the same thing with Calgary this year. And nobody expected the Flames to even be remotely close to a playoff spot, let alone being in fifth place, only two points out of number one in the NHL. So his systems have contributed greatly to it. And you can see that in how they play defense, the manner in which they approach that, it helps to contain shots and all that. So Uh, Full marks to Bob Hartley, and I hope that he gets a contract soon, so that way nobody has to worry about him not being here next year. When I look at the NHL standings to date, it's December 1st and we're recording this, there's no team in the top eight in either the West or the East really that I'm surprised to see there besides the Flames. What about you? No. No. And, like, on that uh, podcast that you and I did, uh, that the other one that we guest appeared on, uh, I even said that, like, the New York Islanders were going to be an upstart team this year, and they've been really good. I know they've shocked a lot of people going from being right down there with Calgary to the number one team in the East. So... No, I, I agree. There hasn't really been any surprises outside of the Flames. And for the teams that are in the playoff slots, besides the Flames and maybe the Islanders, I feel like those players probably, I don't want to make a, a blanket statement for every team, but I think those players probably would still be in the same position if they had a different NHL coach behind the bench. How would you say with most teams, the coaching doesn't really make that much of a difference, but because the Flames are rebuilding and you have a bunch of green players that have never played in the NHL or have extremely limited experience, they have to be taught how to play at the NHL level. And that's where a coach like Hartley is vital because he he is teaching them the right way to become an NHL player. And all of our strongest players outside of Giordano and Hoodler have been the young kids, which that in of itself is somewhat surprising. It is. And and I think, to me, that's been one of the funnest things to watch this year is Bob Hartley not only bring these guys up and teach them how to play at this level, but his enthusiasm when he talks about these kids, too. They're not just another farm call-up or a guy who's taking space in the roster which sends here he's legitimately excited about having these guys on the team oh yeah and like you've heard comments that, that like he's talking about Gaudreau always wanting to be back out on the ice you know like that's it it's encouraging to see that both from a coach and for the player that if they're doing all right that they will be get kept getting thrown out on the ice to go and try and get that equalizing goal or score the insurance marker or whatever. So looking at the season where it is now and what we predict to happen, who do you think the three coaches who will be in contention for Jack Adams come awards night are going to be? 
I don't know who the Islanders coach is, but I would assume that he, that he would be one. Uh, it's Jack Capuano. Yeah. Uh, I would probably go with Willie Desjardins, Capuano, and Hartley as being the finalists. The Vancouver coach, the Islanders coach, and the Flames coach. Yeah. Do, do you think Hartley would be in that discussion if the Flames missed the postseason? I put it this way. The Flames, looking at the team on paper before the season started, uh, pretty much everybody was going, yeah, this team is going to be right there with Buffalo. Everybody except Aaron Ward. Yeah, exactly. And even if, say, the Flames finish ninth or 10th, I think Hartley would be the favorite regardless because what he's done has just been simply amazing. See, I agree with you. I think that even if the Flames miss the postseason, Bob Hartley's name is going to be in those top three guys for that award. I, I've i talked to other people, however. I've thrown this around on Twitter. I've talked to people I know. And a lot of people think in order for Hartley to be considered or even have a good chance of winning and not just be thrown in there as kind of a, a token guy, the Flames have to make the postseason. And I hope that's not the case because... I can't see any coach, even from now to the end of the season, who's going to do more for their team than Bob Hartley. No. And the Flames are quickly gaining a reputation for being one of, if not the hardest team to play against in the league. So that starts from the coach on out, and he's just done an amazing job. He has. And, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm looking through the list here. I don't have the, you know, final four teams every year. But based on what I'm seeing in this list, pretty much every team that has, every coach and every team that has won the Jack Adams has gone into the playoffs. Um, I can't see a year that I can remember offhand where that team's missed the playoffs. So that's not really a great sign. But I also can't think of the last team that we thought was going to be as terrible as Calgary and wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key there. Like, the Flames were looking quite dreadful. You know, our first line consisted of Yuri Hoodler plus a couple of rookies, basically, heading into the season. So, you know, uh, not too many people would expect that team to actually do anything. So Yeah. Well, for the the sake of the Flames' owners, I hope they get Bob Hartley locked up before he gets that nomination. Because he's going to be a lot more expensive if he wins the Jack Adams. Oh yeah, definitely. Having a Stanley Cup ring and a Jack Adams to your credit, I think you can pretty much write your own check there. Pretty much. Here's a blank check. Write a number you feel is appropriate. So we're, we're curious what everybody else has to say. We've got some comments on Twitter, but if you're interested in letting us know what you think it's going to take for Hartley to win Jack Adams, or if you think there's another coach who's more deserving this year, uh, go to firesidechat.ca slash conversation or follow the link from our navigation on the site and either call in or send us an email and let us know if you think he can still have a shot at winning if the Flames don't make the postseason. Yeah, and you can even contact us on Twitter as well. Yeah, that would work at Fireside Podcast or on Facebook at fireside facebook.com slash fireside chat. I'm I I know where people are coming from saying we have to make the postseason, but I hope that's not the case. I think that his body of work speaks for himself, and just because you make the postseason this year, I don't think necessarily means you were the best coach. I think there's a lot of guys that could coach a lot of these teams because you don't need to be the most successful coach. And Hartley's definitely taken a ragtag group of misfits almost and turned them into a bona fide NHL team this year. Mm -hmm. So I think either way, I mean, his body of work so far, I think has spoken enough volume that not only should he get nominated, I think he has to be seriously considered. Just like Giordano for the Norris Trophy. Exactly. And wouldn't it be cool if there were trophies awarded to the flames again like it's been a long time since anyone besides aginla and kipper won trophies and even to have them nominated if we don't make the playoffs yeah well i think Hart, our giordano wins the norris trophy if he stays healthy so i i agree at the very minimum if he keeps up this kind of pace he'll get the heart too <laughs> he very well could we could come home with a lot of hardware this year yeah 
And in, an interesting note about the Jack Adams Award, it's actually voted on, on a poll by the National Hockey League Broadcasters Association. So I think the Broadcasters Association is probably a group that's probably going to recognize what Hartley's done because I imagine, I don't listen to a lot of away games, but I imagine it's a good story that a lot of them are telling about this coach who's turned around this team as they roll into town. Mm-hmm. So I think that sometimes I think, you know, maybe the Eastern guys don't really know or the Southern U.S. guys don't really know what's going on here, but I think everyone's probably taking notice this year. Well, you just have to look at where the flames are in the standings and that that immediately jumps out at you as how the hell are they there (laughs) and and, i mean i can count about five things that i think have made them successful we talked about the defenseman we've talked about the coach i think those are the two biggest things i think the schedule and i think Locke has done well for them and the rookies but i think to me the biggest two have been our top defensive pairing and the coaching i can't argue with the top two for sure well, some good news for the Flames on the injury front. We talked a lot last week about where guys were. Um, starting to get some guys healthy again. And Matt Stajan's back in practice, working to get himself into game shape. He's been out for a while, so he's, he's a little bit out of shape there. But the fact he's in practice, from what I've heard, he's looking pretty good in practice. Um, he should be back in the lineup fairly soon. Which is going to be the interesting time when it forces the Flames' hand to make a move. Um, we've already seen them make a move with Devin Setaguchi being sent down to Adirondack this week and in turn Corbin Knight being recalled or essentially staying here. He had to be sent down just for salary cap reasons. But now that Setaguchi is sent down, um, you and I predicted that. It's no surprise to us. If they have sent somebody else down to make room for a kid, who do you think's next on the chopping block? My candidate for a veteran uh, to depart would actually be Brian McGratton just because of the fact that he hasn't played much this season and with Bullock being there there's not really too much need for having somebody that I think he's only played five or six games this year see now I mentioned that earlier in the year and you didn't seem like you supported at the time but you're behind that idea now yeah, it, it's one of those things that I, I was wanting him, you know, because I like him in the lineup, like his personality, he seems like a good locker room guy, but it, it, we're getting to the point where it's a numbers game and uh, you have to go with the best 23 players and, uh, you know, you can't get rid of Granlund or Joris or even Furland. Uh, with how they've played it you know like that's not fair to those players especially because they've been exceptional uh it since they've been up here and you know it's earned not given well they've earned that's what management's been saying they've got to show that and they have and i it would be disappointing to let mcgratton go but I, if I had to choose between Furland and McGratton, it's not even a contest. See, I think the cool thing about McGratton is he's really become a personality. Like you said, he's a good locker room guy. He does a lot of media stuff. I think more so than a lot of enforcers this team has ever had, I think we know McGratton off the ice better. He's not just the hired gun who you know is just this mean, nasty guy. And I, I think Calgary fans legitimately like the guy, and um, it will be sad if he moves. I, I think there is. I think the other reason to move him is I think there's probably some value to him around the league right now. I don't think you'd have to just wave him and lose him. I think you could probably deal him for something. But yeah, he's played seven games. He has no points and he's a minus one, and only four penalty minutes so far. So yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I mentioned it earlier in the year. He's 33. I think he's probably the next guy to go. Yeah, and maybe uh, the management can convince him to pull a Conroy and just retire and become a coach or something, you know, just to keep his personality and all that in Calgary. I I would want to move him if there's value there simply to get the value of it, but that doesn't mean he couldn't come back. Yeah. He obviously likes it here. He and his wife are rooted in this community. They're doing a lot of stuff here. Even if we trade him away for a fourth or fifth round pick, and he finishes out the year there and then decides to retire and come back, that'd be fine too. But I I feel like there's value there 
that and I know it sounds bad calling these guys assets, but he's an asset and I want the Flames to get the full value from him. No. Yeah. Well, if they can convince him just to stay like Conroy did, then, you know, I would prefer that. But if he wants to continue, then see what you can get. If you would have asked me this question at the beginning of the year, which we did talk about, my first two thoughts, I believe, were uh, Devin Setaguchi and David Jones to be out of here. And surprisingly, when Jones is healthy, he's actually playing pretty well. He's uh, 12 games, 3 goals, and 2 assists for 5 points. And he's a plus 3 right now. So I think if he can't stay healthy, we have to look at moving him, whether that means uh, demoting him, releasing him, trading him. But yeah, I think the easiest guy to pick off at this point is Brian McGratton. Yeah, well, Jones is actually looking more like a $4 million player than a press box guy, so... I just worry how many games we're going to get out of him in a year. Oh yeah, same here, but... Yeah, he's showing better upside than McGratton is. Oh yeah, definitely. And unfortunately, he can't seem to stay healthy. Yeah. Hopefully he can figure that out. If he can, then he is a useful player, it's just... You know, you can't have a guy that's only playing, like, two out of every four games. You can, but not for what he's making. Yes, true. You know, I think there's a role for that in a 13th or 14th forward spot, but I wouldn't be paying that guy $4 million. I'd be paying that guy, you know, 850000 maybe nine hundred max. True. And especially when he's the highest paid forward on the team, believe it or not. Wow, that's a, <laughs> that surprises me quite a bit. Yeah, he's tied with Hoodler, so, you know, uh, that's not good. <laughs> so with Devin Setaguchi being sent down to Adirondack, he got placed on waivers and cleared waivers. Nobody even wanted to take him for us for the low, low price of free. Um, do you think he'll be back? I sincerely doubt it, unless we get, like, 12 more injuries to the forwards. <laughs> Do you think he now becomes the first call-up, or do you think this is almost a banishment? I think that's the last time we see Setaguchi in Calgary, unfortunately for him. Uh, he would ha- Put it this way, he'd have to tear it up in Adirondack consistently for like the next 30 games and be like a point-per-game player down there to even be considered. Get another look. Yeah. Because you yeah. look at how guys like Bill Arnold, uh, Ben Hanowski, and Emil Poirier are, have been playing, in addition to guys like Reinhardt, Knight, and Berchi, uh, why would you give a spot to a guy that hasn't shown anything at the NHL level this season? Yeah, and, and I mean, I wouldn't. I know there's a lot of NHL teams that would say, well, he's the NHL guy on the roster, so let's bring him back up first. But yeah, I think you're probably right. This is probably a one-way ticket to New York State. Yeah, and, you know, it is possible that the Flames could later on trade him for a contract from another team. Like, you wouldn't get anybody exceptional for him, just uh, roster name but he's on a one one way contract one year so if we do you know now that he is down we only have to carry that contract for a year so i don't even know how many teams would want to trade for that on a one year i could see if it was a two or three year but that's a crappy rental well uh, if you look at a team like say the penguins they might need insurance forwards just in case they run into any injury trouble and because they don't really have a ton of forward depth in their prospect pool, so like yeah. like they're I, I think the likelihood of the Penguins calling for Setaguchi is going to depend on how he does in the AHL. Because right now, I doubt you could. I mean, they couldn't give him away for free. Oh no! Like you, would, how would you say you'd probably have to take a no name contract that expires at the end of the year. Uh, basically, like when the Flames got Weidman off of uh, the Capitals, they had to include some guy, I can't remember his name, just to make the contracts balance for that couple of days before free agency hit. So uh, you would likely see something along those lines where the Flames would get an AHL depth guy for the year. Could be. 
And you know what? I'm okay with Setaguchi playing out his one-way deal in Adirondack. He's making like $600,000, which I think is a perfectly acceptable number. And he's a guy that I think may still have something left in his tank. I don't know if he's got it left at the NHL level, but... It's it's weird to go from as productive as he was to as unproductive as he is now. I think maybe the AHL might bring out the best in him. Maybe it's the step lower in pace and you know timing and all that that maybe he's going to excel there. Uh, who knows? He definitely needs to figure out what's not connecting in his game uh, and try to return to what made him a successful 30-goal scorer. I honestly, I don't think he'll do that this year. He might, no. like, if he goes to, the, say, the KHL next year, then he might be able to figure it out over there. Who knows? When Brad Trilliving announced the contract this summer, he said that it was a calculated risk. I don't remember his exact words, but it was a calculated risk to bring him in for one year. To me, I think the risk was worth taking. If you look at the roster we have, it was a risk that was worth taking. What What do you think? Oh, yeah. It, you know, anytime you can add a guy that's only a few years removed from a 30-goal season for nothing. For less than a million bucks. Yeah. It, if he figured it out, it, wow, you got a free asset that you can either use at the trade deadline or sign for longer. It didn't work out that way. But it, it's just like the Flames getting uh, Chris Russell and Joel Colborn. They weren't working out in the cities that they were in. We had the spots. Let's see what they got. And yeah. in those Changes, change of scenery is sometimes what you need. Yeah, and in those cases, it worked out perfectly fine. In set of Gucci's, it didn't. And that's part of rebuilding a roster is trying new things and sometimes if they it, would have tried that for two and a half million i'd be choked for six hundred thousand i have i really don't care yeah exactly well even at two and a half million hey it, at least we're above the cap floor <laughs> so. true but i think it also kind of sets a precedence for other players on the team that we're paying this guy two and a half million and we just you know couldn't even get rid of him on waivers and I think that probably might have a bad dressing room effect, or when it comes time to renegotiate, that'll probably be accounted for. So I think it's good that he's less than a million, because I think it's reflective of where he was in the roster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, like, I am assuming that he was hoping to get a $2.5 million contract in the off season, and that's why it took so long for him to sign. But, yeah, it... Nothing ventured, nothing gained. <laughs> you know. And I, I hope he tears it up in Adirondack because they're doing well right now, and maybe he'll just find his groove and tear it up. They're, they need some forwards right now, so hopefully it'll work out. Well, since uh, he was sent down, Adirondack lost both of their games. so he has You can only win so many in a row. Oh, I know. He didn't play in either game, but still, the curse of Setaguchi. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder which curse is worse, the Honda Center curse or the Setaguchi curse? Well, look at uh, Winnipeg. They got rid of Setaguchi, and magically they find themselves in a playoff spot. <laughs> but then we had Setaguchi, and we also find ourselves in a playoff spot. Well, we defied the odds. <laughs> there you go. Somebody has to, right? Yep. So, Matt, you were doing some look at advanced scouting this week, and uh, you were finding that the stats you were looking at had... Some interesting numbers they were telling you. They actually think the Flames are going to regress from this point. That's worrying news. What were you finding there? Uh, I was looking at the Flames PDO numbers, and uh, that's an advanced statistic. And uh, the Flames had the second highest level, and usually anybody that's over 100% in that statistic they tend to regress to the 100%. Similarly, teams that are below, they tend to move upwards. And uh, unfortunately, the Flames are significantly higher on that particular metric. Uh, last year, of the top teams that were above the 100% threshold on that rating, 
Uh, 17 of the 18 actually regressed from this point in their season forward. So it's looking like the Flames won't quite be as good moving forward. So, and that's fine. So, so for those that don't know, can you explain a little bit more, I guess... You explained what the PDO numbers are, but how accurate have these been in the past? Like, are there teams that we've seen in a similar position to the Flames or the whole reverse that we can look at and say, yeah, PDO predicted that team to either rise or fall? Well, uh, for example, uh, Colorado and Toronto were both heavily lucky, per se, in their seasons, uh, like at... Uh, at this point last year, they the Leafs were one of the top teams in PDO, and it, they kind of fell off the face of the earth and missed the playoffs entirely after that point. And Colorado, they had a lucky season last year, and they did make the playoffs, but as we've seen this year, they've kind of settled right near the bottom again. So, it how, how do you say? It's one of those things where... Nothing is 100% perfect, and the advanced statistics, there are a lot of flaws, but most of the teams that tend to be overperforming tend to not be as good. It'll be interesting to see. I don't personally put a huge amount of stock into, like, Corsi, for example, because you can mess with and Fenwick because you can mess with that by taking shots from anywhere sort of like the Oilers where like they'll go in one on three and just shoot the puck at the goalie and magically they have great Corsi numbers and the Coyotes game on uh, Saturday the Flames actually lost the Corsi rating in that game and Yet, the, in the game, if you watched it, the Flames were the better team for 55 of the 60 minutes. The county was only pressed for about 5 minutes in the back half of the second period. So, nothing is exact or perfect. It's just, the Flames have gone off to a good start. It might not continue all season, that's all. We'll post a, a link later this week uh, to a great Calgary Herald article that runs down a little bit about each of the advanced scouting stats. We'll put it on Twitter. We'll put it on Facebook. Um, it talks a little bit about Corsi, Fenwick, PDO, zone starts, and playing to score effects. For those that aren't familiar, you can get a little bit of a, a brief description of each one. But the PDO is essentially, it stands for Percentage Determined Outcome, and it's really a measure of luck, as much as you can measure luck in the NHL. It's a player team's even strength shooting percentage and save percentage. So it's really the total frequency in which pucks tend to go in the net at both ends of the ice at 5-on-5. Five five. So it's probably the closest thing, would you say, Matt, to measuring luck that you can get? Yeah, that's the one statistic that I find that has been more accurate. And even that's imperfect because the Flames, they're method of playing uh, like they get a lot of odd man rushes due to their speed and their quick breakout passes so their shooting percentage should be higher because of that like we're not just taking shots from everywhere and usually like our goals are nice flashy style making good pass crosses and all that so like, is that a feature of the Flames where it defies the advanced statistics? We'll see. I, you know, it. The Flames. I are, mean, the Flames have already just defied so many statistics this year. I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, this is one more that doesn't tell the true picture of this team. Yeah, exactly. And because the Flames don't really play it in a traditional manner, especially with the fact that the face-offs we've been so terrible at with having three of our four centers out so yeah, like we don't play a traditional possession game that we normally would and a lot of our chances are off the rush where usually a lot of teams cycle the puck so it'll be an interesting case study that's for sure yeah, and we'll, we'll see how it goes this year. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we, you know, don't show up as high as we should in some of those metrics and still end up 
with a really good season just because of everything that the Flames have defied so far as far as logic and stats go. But it's interesting to know that those stats are there. I know some teams put a lot of faith in some of those numbers and some not so much. So it's it's one more measure that may determine what's going to happen this year. I think that's the best way to look at it. It's not necessarily going to tell us for sure or have 100% accuracy, but it's one more stat that maybe says this isn't going to last. Yeah, and uh, like that's one of those things where like if you expect them to not be as good and they continue to be good, then hey, that's awesome. If they do regress, well, they did get off to a hot start and the numbers got caught up to them. You know, it's one of those things that there is some predictive value with the any of the advanced statistics, but it, like everything, it doesn't tell the whole story. Exactly. So you just gotta watch the games, sit back, and enjoy. <laughs> For sure. Matt, it's All-Star season in the NHL. All-Star voting's open right now, and as far as I can see, there's three flames that are on the ballot this year. Um, we've got TJ Brody, Mark Giordano, and Jonas Hiller, who you can pick on the website. Have you done your all-star voting? No. <laughs> You're allowed to vote ten times a day, and I'd encourage everyone to at least vote once. Try to get our, our Flames players on the team. I think it would be fantastic to get uh, Brody, Gio, and Hiller all at the all-star game this year in Columbus. Well, I think that whether they get voted in or not, I, that... Those three players should get there. Their play definitely speaks for itself. Yeah. Well, Brody and Giordano for sure. Maybe Yuri Hoodler. Possibly Goudreau and Monaghan, depending. It doesn't... I don't know if you can actually write in a player this year. I know in the past you could... Oh, yeah, you can. Um, there's a way you can pick any player you want to. So you could go vote for all Flames if you want to. You get to vote for three forwards, two defensemen, and a goaltender. Um, so you could pick all flames. You could pick those three are kind of in the suggested group that the NHL gives you. But let's try to let's try to get our team represented. We haven't been well resent, represented at the All Star game for a couple years. So I'd love to see as many flames as we can wearing an All Star jersey. Yeah. Well, in the past couple of years, the Flames really haven't had too many players that were deserving of an All Star appearance. Which true. This, this year, though, the there's at least five players to choose from. And that's where I kind of want to strike while the iron's hot. Who knows what next year's going to look like the year after, so let's capitalize on this while we can. Exactly. Though there is a curse. It always seems like every year somebody gets really badly hurt at the All-Star game. Yeah, I remember Doug Waite getting hurt that one year. Yeah, it seems like there's always somebody that leaves the All-Star game hurt that wasn't hurt when they come in so maybe it's better for all of our guys to not be in the all-star game and just take the weekend to rest and relax but it, it's always fun to vote even if you don't like the all-star game I, I always find it's fun to vote fun to see how fans are voting and see who fans think should be in there some of the the guys at the nhl.com site suggests like justin schultz um you know that they're probably trying to pick one representative per team tyler myers not necessarily all stars, but trying to represent every team there. Yeah, do is it still a rule that every team has to have one player? I haven't seen that. Um, could be. I'm. I haven't looked at the full rules yet, but it looks like you can submit a list of all five from your team if you want to. Yeah. No. I mean, like for the actual game itself, does everybody need oh. to be represented? I don't know. I I have a feeling in my mind that at some point the Flames had no representatives for a couple of years. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Good question. If anybody knows, let us know because I'm curious now. Yeah. Uh, Because, like, there's some teams that really don't deserve anybody. (laughs) And, you know, I'll admit there's been years that the Flames haven't deserved anybody. There's a couple years that, you know, in the 90s, even the last couple where you could say, there's really, like last year, I think you could look around outside of maybe um, Geo last year, you could look around and say there's really nobody that deserves to go to the All-Star game. Yeah. Well, thankfully for the Olympics, that spared us that particular dilemma. That's true. That's true. So go vote. Uh, you don't have to cast 10 votes a day. That's a little excessive, but at least throw one vote in to get our Calgary guys at the game. 
because it'd be fun to see. I think I'd probably watch the game for the first time in five, six years, I think, if we had Flames players on the ice. Yeah, well, they haven't had a uh, all-star game for the last two years with the Olympics and the lockout, so... The lockout, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I watched an all-star game. Man, it's been a while. Yeah. Three years now, I think, so... Well, before we wrap up, a couple more notes. Um, just as a note for fans, Mike Holditch, who was the one of the uh, assistant GMs for the Flames, has resigned from the team. He's been here for a while. He's been here for, I think, 20 years. And he was really the finance guy. He was the salary cap genius. He was the guy who negotiated contracts, reminded the team um, of contracts and what their salary obligations were. He navigated all the CBA stuff. So he's going to be a loss to the team. Um, nobody's sure what he's doing or why he left, but I have a feeling after 20 years, it's probably just time to move on. Not much you can say without more information. Just thank you for doing your job. It's good to see that we have loyal soldiers, guys. They've been around for 20 years with this organization. I doubt there's many guys within the operations team who we can probably say that about. Yeah, exactly. Like The only other name that springs to mind is Todd Button. Yeah, yeah, he's been here. I mean, you know, who knows about the marketing guys or any of the behind-the-scenes guys, but as far as hockey ops stuff goes, Holditch has been around forever, and um, I'll be curious to see if his duties get split up among the the other two assistant GMs that we have, Brad and uh, Craig, or if they bring in somebody else who has a finance background to be that cap contract guy. We'll I'll have to wait and see. For sure. Um, thought we'd end off this week with a bit of a prospect update. We've done some Adirondack updates the last couple weeks, but there's some good news for the Flames prospects this week. The World Juniors roster has got unveiled, and Morgan Klimchuk has been invited to the Canadian team, while Rafikov is invited to Russia. No, I'm not surprised about Rafikov. I'm a little surprised about Klimchuk. What about you? Uh, both of them seem like decent choices i i'm a little surprised with klimchuk just because he hasn't had a spectacular start to this to the season he's been okay not bad it's just yeah when i look around the chl it seems to me like there's been better players um that could have been taken if you're looking at numbers just this year yeah that's uh, it's probably just uh because he's 20 years old now and or 19 20 whatever and he's more gonna be relied on as an experienced player it'll be interesting to see him play and i mean he hasn't necessarily made the final roster either yet no he's just been invited to camp so you know i think they're inviting him by looking at his body of work as a junior as a whole i mean this year he's doing better than point per game he's played 18 games with 20 points in 2013-2014, he did 74 points in 57 games. The year before, he was 76 points in 72 games. So I think if you look at it as a whole, why not invite him to camp and let him fight for that spot? Yeah, and he hasn't been bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that with the depth of the talent pool in the CHL, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily expected him to get the nod even for the camp. No. But, you know, he'll, we'll see. I'm hoping he makes the team. Like, I'm not slamming Klimchuk for some reason. No, I'm not either. Uh, you know, I'm just, like, I'm hoping that he makes the team and has a great World Junior experience. It just caught me a little off guard, that's all. Exactly. And you never you never know, maybe that's the motivation that he's going to need in order to prove that he, you know, can be on that team and pick up his season. Yeah, like I expected Rafikov to make Team Russia. He's been one of the best defensemen, young defensemen in Russia. So, yeah, that one I'm not surprised about. I expected Rafikov on that roster. Yeah. Well, in the VHL, um, he's second or first in uh, points for defensemen, so, and that's a men's league. So it's not unexpected that he's there. I always find that if there's at least one Flames player, I tend to watch a lot more of the World Junior games than I would if there's no Flames guys there. So I'm hoping both guys make the team because I really like watching those games and it, I guess it gives me an excuse to watch them. Yeah, usually I'm 
so busy that I don't have the opportunity, but if there's a Flames guy, I'll make sure to watch those games. So. Yeah, exactly. Especially if there's a Flames guy on Team Canada. I think that if uh, Klimchuk can make the team, I'll probably watch every Canada game. Yeah, it's just like uh, back when Backland was playing for Team Sweden, like I watched all those games. Exactly, and without him, I wouldn't watch the Team Sweden game. Exactly, like the years after, yeah, the years after, it's like, okay, who cares? (laughs) On the college front, uh, John Gillies got a shutout on Saturday against Boston College, which is good, and Mark Jankowski had the only assist on, had the assist on the only goal of the game as Providence beat the Eagles 1-0, so two of our prospects played against each other, Jankowski managed to help with the puck um, in the net, and John Gillies got a shutout on Saturday. Uh, Gillies was named Hockey East Defensive Player of the Week for his back-to-back shutouts. So, you know, as much as it's a lower league, always good to see guys having great success there. Yeah. And I, I think that I think you pointed out a couple years ago, but I still think Gillies is going to be a hot goaltending prospect for this team. Definitely. And I, I know some people are worried about Jankowski with his lack of point production, but in the... Uh, 16 games that he's played in he has a grand total of I do believe six points which if you look at the amount of goals that Providence scored uh, he's actually figuring in on 37.5 percent of the total goals scored by Providence it's just that Providence doesn't score at all (laughs) so Like, stats can be misleading at times, and the fact that he is contributing at a high percentage of the overall offense, it's a good thing. It's just that you'd always wish that his points would be a little higher. You know, I'm actually less concerned about Jankowski now, seeing the depth that the Flames have, than I was before, because I think... Going as high as he did in the draft, people were saying this guy has to turn out to be, you know, a top six forward. And I think as we look at the team and the roster they've assembled and even the, you know, farm prospects, to me, I think as long as Jankowski can crack, you know, an NHL spot or first call up spot, I'm fine with that. I don't think there's as much pressure on him now to be the leader of this rebuild as there might have been. And I'd be okay if he ended up making the team as a third liner or even, you know, kind of a first call-up guy. Well, the thing is, is that at the time, the Flames' prospect pool was basically Berchi and that was it. So, like, for notable players. And he unfairly got heaped a lot of, you know, expectations that, oh, this is going to be the next Berchi guy. And like, the thing is, is that he's a six foot four center that's quick and plays defensively responsible and is a good face-off guy. So even if he only becomes a guy like Joel Otto, well, that's great. It, you know. Yeah, I, I just don't see him being the offensive threat you'd want as a full-time, you know, top six guy, but I can see him being kind of the two-way forward that I might want as a, a mainstay on my third line. Yeah, and, like, if he does figure and out... special teams lines. Yeah, exactly. And if he does figure out the offensive game at the NHL level, that's just a bonus. And, and you know, worst-case scenario is that he's a good defensive forward moving forward for the Flames. Yeah, and you're right that at the time there was a lot of pressure on him, but I think, like I said, I'm more optimistic now seeing how he doesn't need to slot into a certain role anymore. I think we can take longer to develop him, and there's a lot more doors open to him now as far as what type of player he needs to be. And that's a good thing because of the fact that he doesn't have the expectations of needing to be the Sean Monaghan type guy. Which, at the time, he was the only center that the Flames had in the prospect pool. Now we have both Monaghan and Bennett, in addition to guys Mm -hmm. like Colborne and others. So, you know, it takes some pressure off, but it also requires him to step up his own game once he gets out of the college ranks to make the NHL and be successful. For sure. Well, let's look at the week coming up. Uh, two re- I guess all three, two rematches from last week. 
Um, we're coming back home, and we will see on Tuesday the uh, Coyotes, who we saw on Saturday, and we beat them 3 nothing. Then we see the Avalanche come on Thursday, and on Saturday we have a rematch against the Sharks. Another week with six points on the table. How do you think we're going to do? I'm going to go with four points this time. I think we'll beat the two weaker sisters in Phoenix and Colorado, and I think we might drop the Sharks game. I think we got lucky in the last Sharks game. I don't think we can do it two weeks in a row. I'm going to go with you. I think we'll win uh, the Arizona game. I think we'll win the Colorado game. And if we're lucky, we'll make it out of uh, the San Jose game with maybe a shootout win. Yeah. It, but it's one of those things points. that uh, they could easily win all three. They could lose all three. This team, is, who knows? We've been on such a good roll of late. Like, we went 9-4 and four in uh, November. So, who knows? It might carry over. It might not. In the back of my head, I keep looking at the schedule saying, at some point, this is going to be the week that we just drop them all. And it's not happening, and that's the amazing thing. Well, the thing is is that since the line brawl in uh, Vancouver, uh, the Flames uh, haven't lost three in a row since. That's amazing. Like That that, was last season. Yeah, uh, and we've played 60 games since then. And we haven't lost three in a row since. I, I think we did lose like three right on that schedule around that time. But like since that point, they haven't lost three since. So. Maybe if Hartley wins the Jack Adams, he should call Tortor- Tortorella up there because Tortorella kickstarted his team for him. Yeah. <laughs> they can be co winners of the trophy. Maybe uh, if uh, the Oilers get rid of Eakins, uh, Hartley can put a good word in for Torts with the, the Oilers. <laughs> there you go. We need more line brawls every time we have Battle of Alberta. Exactly. Well, Matt, it's going to be another fun week of Flames hockey. Enjoy it, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, take care, everyone. Thanks for listening, and have an awesome week. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.